Good evening. My name is Lisa Schnell. I'm the Interim Dean of the Honours College here, and on behalf of President Tom Sullivan and our Provost David Rozovsky, um, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, I feel like I should welcome you on behalf of Mayor Moreau Weinberger as well. There are so many folks from Burlington's greater community outside of UVM, and it's great to see so many folks from outside of UVM here tonight as well. Our distinguished guest, ta Coates, is an award-winning writer and investigative journalist, a true public intellectual in this country and really in the world, who brings an important and impassioned voice to our time and especially here on Election Day. You know, when I made arrangements to have ta Coates here um, as part of our first year read program and I talked with his agent and we worked out dates and it just didn't even occur to me that we were choosing election day. And then when I put it on my calendar and realized that it was election day, I thought, wow, there's something kind of magic about that. So I'm just really, it's just wonderful to have him here t any day, but today's really special. His book, as many of you know, his book, Between the World and Me, won the National Book Award and the NAACP Image Award. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And, and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Our first year students at UVM this year were asked to read Between the World and Me um, over the summer and to talk about it when they got to campus. I'm a dean, but I'm also a teacher of first-year students, and as someone who sat in those classrooms with students who had read the book and discussed it, I discussed it with them, so did lots of teachers on this campus, and I read what they wrote about it. I can say, truly, with no exaggeration whatsoever, that this is one, perhaps the most deeply affecting book that we've ever assigned for summer reading at UVM. I know the students would agree with me. Tonight we will enjoy a brief reading by Mr. Coates, followed by a conversation between Mr. Coates and distinguished, uh, University Distinguished Professor Major Jackson, and then there'll be some questions from students. I, I fully expect it'll be just an amazing evening. I'd like to first start by just thanking all of the partners of the university who have helped to make this event possible. It's a big event, there are a lot of people involved the First Year Read Committee, of which I am a member, the First Year Experience Committee at UVM, and really the amazing folks in the President's Office who organize these events, Renee Soutier, Kelly O'Malley, and Susan Davidson, they work so hard, it's so great to um, see this come to fruition. I'd also like to welcome members of our Ira Allen Society, generous supporters of student scholarships and academic programming at UVM. They're with us this evening, and I'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, just before I introduce the speakers, our speaker and, um, and his interlocutor, uh, I want to just ha have just a few sort of logistical things to say. Um, there are so many of you here, and so just a couple of notes about where you might exit, where we too need to exit. We don't expect that we will until the event is over, but you'll see that there are a whole bunch of doors over there and there are doors over here and where you came in. Um, and um, just take a note of where the exits are. Please no recording of any kind, no videotaping and no picture taking. Uh, we have UVM video here and the video will be available for viewing through the library. It would also be great if everybody would, right now, turn off your cell phones because we definitely don't want cell phones to be dinging and ringing throughout the evening. Finally, just to let you know that there are books for sale on the table on the east wall and uh, the same side that you entered today and, and you can um, access those after the event. And I think that's it for logistics, so let me introduce our, our, the, the folks who will occupy these chairs up here. University Distinguished Professor Major Jackson is my colleague in the English department. He's the author of four books of poetry, most recently Roll Deep. A recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, Cave Canham Poetry Prize, and a Whiting Writers Award, 
His poems and essays have been translated into Spanish, German, Italian, and Chinese. They appear widely in distinguished journals and magazines, including The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Paris Review. Major Jackson is the Richard A. Dennis Professor of English. He serves as the poetry editor of the Harvard Review, and he teaches our students here at UVM. ta Coates is a distinguished writer in residence at NYU's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. He is the author of the best-selling books, The Beautiful Struggle, We Were Eight Years in Power, and of course, Between the World and Me, which won the National Book Award in 2015. Tanahasi is the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. He's also the current author of the Marvel comics, The Black Panther and Captain America. It is just an immense pleasure to have him with us. Thank you guys. Um, it's, uh, you know, a, a book is like a, you're a child. And I can say this now that I have raised an 18 year old child. Um, you struggle with your child. And you go back and forth with your child, and you guys have a, a hard time and a difficult. Relationship and, and the only way you really see your child um, is within the confines of that house. And so you see all the foibles and problems of your child. Even as you know lo you love your child and you think your child is wonderful. And then like one day you encounter someone who did not raise your child, who you know doesn't see your child through the lens of all of those foibles and all of those fights and all of those problems, and they tell you how wonderful your child is. And you're like, you talking about the same kid? <laughs> and, and you can never really see the child in the way that the people uh, outside, you know what I mean, who, who encounter that, that, that child see it. And, and, and the book is like this. I, I say it to say, like, when I see between the world and me, um, <laughs> I see pain. And I see me being on my um, third or fourth draft of this book. And actually having to come up, I was coming up this way, over to Middlebury College for the language school. And I had to get this draft of Between the World and Me done, uh, summer 2014. And I was not convinced that I was going to, you know, get it done. And the fact that it got done, that it got accepted by my editor, um, that it would, you know, prove to be of, um, I guess, such force that, you know, you guys would be out here uh, tonight. It's remarkable. I can't believe this is my child. Um, <laughs> I'm stunned. I'm, I'm going to do a, a quick reading, but I just, just want to make a, you know, a, a point uh, about a couple of people uh, who, are, who are here tonight. Uh, first of all, my, my friend Rachel Zellers is Oh, she's right there in the front row. My friend Rachel Zellers is here. And Rachel is so important because this uh, book begins, you know, for those of you who read it know, uh, with the death of um, our mutual friend, uh, Prince Jones. And so uh, for Rachel to be here, not just, you know, in support of me, which I appreciate, but you guys' presence here is, is testament to the life of Prince, who... who um, <laughs> who was real to us, you know, who was not like a, a smartphone, you know, video, um, who was not, you know, a hashtag, was an actual real breathing person who, who was taken uh, from us. Second, I just, you know, me and Major are going to talk, you know, in a second, but I'm just going to tell you guys about Major for uh, a bit. Um, you know, there was a time when I was, you know, I told him when I, when I saw him the night that we actually had met before. 
And it was another era uh, when I was a much, much younger uh, man uh, and slightly more delusional and thought that I might grow up one day to become a poet. Um, I was disabused of this notion, thankfully. <laughs> But, you know, among the, you know, a group of folks that I, I looked up to, you know, uh, back then was, a, you know, a crew major was a part of uh, called the Dark Room Poetry Collective. Um, and if you were young and you were black in the, you know, early to mid 90s, you know, these folks were like, you know, exemplars for, for who you, you know, wanted to be. And they would come down to DC and read, read while I was, you know, in school. Um, and I would see them, I would see, you know, I would see Sharon Strange and John Keane and all these guys, and I just idolized, you know, these folks. And so it is uh, a tremendous pleasure to be here tonight, you know, particularly to, you know, be interviewed uh, by Major. You guys have a, a real treasure uh, in your midst. Um, Between the World and Me is a book about fear. Uh, above all, when I, when I wrote this book, one of the things I, I really wanted to counter, you know, this, this was, as I said, you know, in like 2013, 2014, and it was a period where, um, given what was happening in the ascendant nature of the Black Lives Matter movement, there was a lot of talk about anger. Uh, and, and I thought that one of the things that people often missed about the African American community was how much fear there actually was. And this was not like, um, a way that we were traditionally presented, and so I, I thought I would, you know, flip it a little bit. So I'm going to read a, a little bit about fear tonight. And I am afraid. I feel the fear most acutely whenever you leave me. But I was afraid long before you, and in this I was unoriginal. When I was your age, the only people I knew were black, and all of them were powerfully, adamantly, dangerously afraid. I had seen this fear all my young life, though I had not always recognized it as such. It was always right in front of me. The fear was there in the extravagant boys of my neighborhood in their large rings and medallions, their big puffy coats and full-length fur-collared leathers, which was their armor against the world. They would stand on the corner of Gwen Oak and Liberty or Cold Spring and Park Heights or outside Mundarmin Mall with their hands dipped in Russell sweats. I think back to those boys now, and all I see is fear, and all I see is them girding themselves against the ghosts of the bad old days when the Mississippi mob gathered round their grandfathers so that the branches of the black body might be torched, then cut away. The fear lived on in their practice bop, their slouching denim, their big t-shirts, the calculated angle of their baseball caps, a catalog of behaviors and garments enlisted to inspire the fear that these boys were in firm possession of everything they desired. I saw it in their customs of war. I was no older than five, sitting out on the steps of my home on Woodbrook Avenue, watching two shirtless boys circle each other close and buck shoulders. From then on, I knew that there was a ritual to a street fight, bylaws and codes, that in their very need attested to all the vulnerability of the black teenage body. I heard the fear in the first music I ever knew, the music that pumped up from boom boxes full of grand boasts and bluster. The boys who stood out on Garrison and Liberty up on Park Heights loved this music because it told them against all evidence and odds that they were masters of their own lives, their own streets, and their own bodies. I saw it in the girls in their loud laughter and their gilded bamboo earrings that announced their names thrice over. And I saw it in their brutal language and hard gaze, how they would cut you with their eyes and destroy you with their words for the sin of playing too much. Keep my name out of your mouth, they would say. I would watch them after school, how they squared off like boxers, Vaselined up, earrings off, Reeboks on, and left at each other. I felt the fear in the visit to my Nana's home in Philadelphia. You never knew her. I barely knew her. But what I remember is her hard manner, her rough voice. And I knew that my father's father was dead, and that my Uncle Oscar was dead, and that my Uncle David was dead, and that each of these instances was unnatural. And I saw it 
and my own father who loves you, who counsels you, who slipped me money to care for you. My father was so very afraid. I felt it in the sting of his black leather belt, which he applied with more anxiety than anger. My father, who beat me as if someone might steal me away, because that is exactly what was happening all around us. Everyone had lost a child, somehow to the streets, somehow to jail, somehow to drugs, somehow to guns. It was said that these lost girls were sweet as honey and would not hurt a fly. It was said that these lost boys had just received a GED and had begun to turn their lives around. And now they were gone, and their legacy was a great fear. Thank you. Um, so, I'm happy you started with poetry. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, so, is there a volume of poems coming someday? Kind of how say, come on. You, you know, it's funny. It's, um, so I, I you know, b back in that era when I thought I was going to be a poet, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, was, I was telling Major, I went into this, to this workshop up at uh, Provincetown with, with the great Yusef Kumanyaka and, um, you know, there were other tremendous poets. You know, in, in, in that workshop, uh, Yona Harvey, Terrence Hayes, Joel Diaz Ford, there's just a lot of talent in there. And it became clear that I was in the bottom quintile <laughs> of, of that talent. Now, that's not so bad. I, I've been bad at things all my life. It's okay. Um, I was, you know, if you love something, you love it. it you know, you know I, I didn't feel like I had it to be, you know, number one. But poetry, out of all of the literary art forms, is also the hardest to make a living at. Mm. <laughs> and, and I felt like I could do one of those, but I couldn't do both of them together. You know what I mean? Like, I couldn't be at the bottom and also, you know, be scraped. You know, I could, I, you know, I gotta pick one evil. I can't take both evils, and it's funny because <laughs> that was actually the summer that I, you know, literally got my first, you know, professional writing job. I, I think about, you know, me and Yona joke about this, I think about it all the time, but it just, um, I, I don't think people, and this was clear to me at the time, I, I don't think people realize the amount of discipline and sheer talent it takes to be a great poet. Mm. And I'm, I'm not, um, it's not to blow smoke, I mean, this is having, like, actually tried to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it was really, really clear to me, like, how, um, how hard it is. Now, now, having said that, I actually think, um, I'm glad I, I did spend that time studying. And I, I, like, even now when I teach my nonfiction courses, I always start with poetry. Right. Uh, because I think writers of other forms actually could benefit from studying poetry. For well, them. for me, it's clear that not only between the world and me, but so much of your work evidences your workshop in that particular, uh, particular genre. I'm also thinking about the great tradition of writers produced at um, Howard um, mm -hmm. and the conscious, consciousness that is, um, is gained from being a, being a student there. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that tradition and you seeing yourself within that lineage of Toni Morrison and yeah. Baraka and Lucille Clifton and Sterling Brown. Yeah. And, um, well, I mean, there's no place really like Howard. Um, and when I was there, you know, people w had taken to calling it the black Harvard. But that's not true. And that's no disrespect to Harvard, but um, it, Howard isn't the black anything. It's, it's a unique, you know, particular thing. I think largely because of this period of Jim Crow and, and segregation. Um, one of the perverse positive side effects is that all of the talent was kind of siloed into these, you know, small, you know, sort of these, these, this particular group of historically black colleges and universities, and, Harvard, and Howard being, you know, among the most prominent. So what that means is, you know, for, for that period, you know, basically coming out of slavery, you know, up until the 1960s, mm. 
anybody who I loved, anybody who I had admired, had spent some time at, at, at Howard, and a great many of them, you know, had, had either taught or, or, or went there. Lane Locke, you know, had taught there. Uh, uh, Toni Morrison had gone there. Lucille Clifton had gone there. Uh, Ossie Davis had, 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 had gone there. Baraka had gone there. I mean, it was just so many of, of, of my idols who, who had been there. And what it, what it gave me was a, a deep sense of, of roots. Mm. Um, I saw Toni Morrison give um, convocation, I think, in 96. And I, I, like, I didn't understand this at the time, but it was like Toni Morrison had been taught by Elaine Locke. Do you know what I mean? So it's like she had a literal touchstone to the Harlem Renaissance. And, and that was just so, you know, uh, profound to me. You know what I mean? Right. To be like that, you know, that, that, that connected in. It, it, it gave me a deep sense of, 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 a, of a literary home. Well, that is absolutely what animated the Darkroom Collective at that time. Mm. And part of the reason why we um, love coming down to D.C. and coming down to Howard because of that lineage. You mentioned um, being a teacher right now, and congratulations on your appointment at NYU. I know you were at MIT as well. Um, any chance of us bringing you to Vermont? <laughs> Joking. That's trying to get me in trouble, man. I know. Um, see, Razor won't tell you this, but he was just complaining about not being able to get his hair cut up there, see? <laughs> so... <laughs> It's a beautiful town, though. It really is. It's a beautiful, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous town. <laughs> um, so what do you hope to impart to your students? Because clearly one of the themes of the book, Between the World and Me, is that sometimes um, education in school does not mm. um, address the inner needs, the emotional needs of certain segments of society. Yeah. So what do you hope to impart to your students? And do you have them call you Professor Coates or Tanahasi? I really try hard to get them to call me Tanahasi. Okay. I work really hard. They don't always mm -hmm. go for that. But I try really, really hard to get them to call me Tanahasi. Because um, I didn't even graduate from college. So I mean, I don't like professor. I mean, it doesn't you know, quite work. Um, <laughs> But, and, and, and that's the other thing, you know, it's always awkward, like, whenever, like, I'm, like, to be, like, why, like, I'm teaching at NYU, I mean, I could barely make it through, I didn't make it through Howard, you know what I mean? So, it's always this sort of, you know, shock at being there. You, you know, the main thing I try to, I, I teach in the, the journalism school um, at NYU, and the main thing I try to get them to do is to learn to respect the beauty of language. Mm. And that sounds like something that everybody has or seems obvious, but it's actually not. You know, um, I actually think this goes for more than journalists, but for journalists specifically, there's this notion that what you need to do, and I mean even, you know, like literary long-form journalists, the idea is to, you know, get the facts down, get the, you know, structure right, get the story across. But I, again, like one of the great lessons, you know, I, I learned as a poet was to pay attention to every single word. Mm -hmm. You know, pay attention to how they're, you know, strung together. You know, I always say like when I, when I, when I write, I don't want to write things that people read, put down, and say, hmm, that seems correct. You know, um, I, I want them to be haunted. Mm -hmm. You know, I want them to go to bed thinking about it, wake up thinking about it, go to work thinking about it, tell all their friends, you know, that they can't stop thinking about it, and then I want their friends to, you know, go and read and feel the same way. Mm -hmm. But I think that is, as much as that, you know, part of that is definitely the story you're trying to tell, but I think a large portion of that is finding the correct words and organizing them, you know, in a way that haunts people. And speaking of haunting, I mean, that's definitely what happened with James Baldwin. Right. He haunted you. Could yes. you talk about that particular book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fire Next Time. Yeah, of yeah. course. So I, um, I read Fire Next Time for the first time when I was at Howard. I sat and found his library and read it all in one day. And it was like, I didn't really, like, completely get it. You know, I mean, I felt it. It was, a, another, another, it was the same sort of thing. Like, I could feel it. I could feel the beauty of the words. I, I couldn't, I was not quite at an intellectual level at that point where I could grapple with everything, you know, he was saying and, and, and trying to get across. And it's funny because what happened was, 
I'm trying to remember why. But for some reason around 2012, 2013, and, I, and I'm pretty sure it has something to do with Obama, but I can't like, you know, make it quite connect. I decided to go back and read Fire next time. Mm-hmm. And like, it was more beautiful than I remembered. And it's always a, a great experience when you have that, things that you read as a young reader, to come back to them, you know, some 20 years later almost, and say, wow, this, is, this really was great. Like, I wasn't, you know, crazy. I didn't have bad taste, you know what I mean? I knew <laughs> I was right. But then I could see it, you know what I mean? Like, I could see yeah. all the layers and the levels. And, you know, like, I, I think of Ball when, um, like, like, I think of Marvin Gaye. Like, I'm a huge Marvin Gaye fan. And Marvin Gaye had all of these registers that he would sing and, you know, his natural voice, you know, his falsetto. And he could, you know, do all of these things with his voice. And, and Baldwin was, for me, like that as a writer. He had this repertorial voice where he could, you know, say ghosts in that book, sit with Elijah Muhammad and say, this happened, this happened, this happened, you mm-hmm. know. Then he had this analytical voice where he could actually analyze, you know what I mean, what, you know, the Nation of Islam meant. Um, he had this memoir, reflective voice, where he could talk about his own experience with the church and religion. And then he had this kind of like poetic voice that was like a thousand feet in the air, you know, where he could talk about Harlem and, you know, use these beautiful, you know, long, what should be but were not run-on sentences, mm-hmm. you know, and you would just get lost in it. And, and literally, when I was working on uh, Between the World and Me, myself and my editor, Chris Jackson, spent so much time looking at that book. Um, not, you know, because it wasn't going to be the same book, not trying to do what he did, but trying to understand how somebody could sing like that. Well, there's, you know? that's a level of truth-telling that I think you've reinstituted in, into, um, into public dialogue and, and debate. And there was also his pulpit voice mm-hmm. uh, that we also have mm-hmm. kind of admire. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that there are aspiring writers in, in the audience as well as uh, journalists, and I'm thinking about students. And clearly your life is evidence of the writer can be heard in a, in a democracy, but what we're experiencing right now is an assault mm. on, the, on, uh, on that very important bedrock mm-hmm. of, a, of a democracy. How do, you, how do you protect your voice and your kind of analytical mind from um, that assault? Mm. How do you retain mm. your sanctity as a writer when we have, uh, mm. from the highest office in the land, this idea that mm. mainstream media is its own propaganda mm. machine. Mm. Well, I stay off Twitter. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like you tell. <laughs> um, it was a huge. I left in last December. My wife is like, "Wow, well, you seem like a much happier person." <laughs> um, um, so I, I, I actually do think. At least for me, it became um, really important to control what was coming in. Mm-hmm. You know, not at, but, and I don't mean that like to control, like, like not to read things that you disagreed with. I, I don't mean it like that. But some things are worthless. Mm-hmm. Some things intellectually just, just have no words. Sometimes people are just obviously lying. Mm-hmm. Um, if I know that there's climate change, and listen, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not, this is just me. It's just ta talking. You might have some professors here who are very wise, very intelligent, who would disagree with this. If I know climate change is a reality. I'm, I'm just not going to spend an hour talking to a creationist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, or a global warming denier. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not, like, I, my mind is too sacred to me <laughs> to subject it to that. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And when you write about the force of racism in America and in American history, there are creationists. Mm. There are a large number of creationists in this you know, field who um, are not, frankly, qualified to have a discussion. Um, but because of the way power has flowed in this country, because of the hierarchy in this country, they get to talk about it. Mm. Um, I, I, try, I try really hard to stay away from that. Yeah. Because there are people like, I want to be clear here, like, that doesn't mean that you don't engage people who disagree with you. But who disagrees with you, 
right now at this moment is being defined in a certain way. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. Like, um, I feel that, you know, white supremacy is at the core of this country, and so there's a notion that I should therefore engage with someone who thinks it isn't. But in fact, there's a whole other set of arguments that come after I say that, that I could also engage with, you know what I mean, on someone mm -hmm. that, that disagrees. How does that work? What is the manifest manifestation of that? How does that work, you know, in terms of gender? How does that work in terms of capitalism? There are a whole host of other more interesting disagreements and questions I could be asking instead of spending time trying to convince this creationist <laughs> that evolution is real. You know? Yeah. It, it feels like a tremendous waste of my own limited <laughs> mental energy. Well, so also a way of, again, as I pointed out, dismantling um, truth-telling. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the role of editors and other uh, staff that are behind your articles. We see the finished product mm -hmm. at The Atlantic when you were national correspondent. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris Jackson is a great collaborator mm -hmm. of yours. Um, could you talk about fact checking and that whole process right. of your pieces coming out into the world? Yeah, I was, I was you know, very fortunate at The Atlantic. Uh, I'm still very fortunate um, at you know, One World. Um, I had a great team around me, mm. you know? I mean, if you are going to put, and it, it's funny how, how much the world has changed, but in 2014, uh, it was still radical to make a case for reparations on, on the cover of the Atlantic. And if you were going to do that, um, you had to, or you better be right. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean you better be right, like everybody has to agree with you, you better be right. But every name better be spelled right, every, you know what I mean? Like, if you said it happened on this date, that better be right. If you yeah. say, you know, 60%, you know, of America's exports were, you know, cotton that went through slave hands, that better be right. That better be right. It better not be off by a little bit inside, you know, like, they put, like, five fact checkers on that, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure every little thing, you know, was, was good. I mean, one, one of the most interesting and I think rewarding things that I took from my time there was that in fact, you know, those arguments which during a different time, and I remember this well, were not seen as, you know, sorts of arguments that should be in a magazine like The Atlantic. A case for reparations? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, bet. Um, among others, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah. like, they could stand up to all of that scrutiny. Mm -hmm. You know, they totally could. Like, you could do it at the, at the highest level, you know what I mean, with everything fact-checked and everything, you know, all your, you know, uh, T's crossed and all your I's dotted, you know? Is some of that owed to your undergraduate years as a historian. I was thinking about yeah. the Chronicle did this wonderful uh, piece on you about um, pretty much celebrating your, your uh, cred as a, mm -hmm. you're a journalist, but your cred as a historian. Um, I'm thinking about your engagement with the Civil War. Yeah. Um, well, no, you got it exactly right. I was a history yeah. major at Howard, and, and Howard, you know, has a tremendous you know, tradition, you know, in that, in that history department. Mm -hmm. And I just had people who, um, I, I have always been lucky, and I think I just started, like, with my mom and my dad, but I have always been lucky in um, my in-house opposition, if that makes sense. I, I have always had, like, really tough people to argue with and, and to fight with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just been true, you know, all of my life, you know what I mean? It goes back, as I, you know, said to my mom who used to, you know, make me write essays when I got in trouble, you know, and my dad who used to, you know, debate about whatever was on NPR and wanted to fight about everything. And, you know, wanted to fight about this book. And, you know, once I got to Howard, you know, and, you know, these history professors that, you know, wanted everything documented and you had to go read journal articles and, you know, to when I left there, and, you know, my first editor, David Carr, and, you know, even the students at Howard, you know what I mean, who were just so, like, up here, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and so eager to, to, to fight, that um, I really felt like by the time I started talking to a broader, you know, audience, by the time I, I you know, I got to, like, the Atlantic, or even before that, you know, I felt like I had been through it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, because the fact of the matter is I had been through it because I had been arguing with the people who knew all of the minutiae about black people mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so um, I felt like 
very much, you know, battle tested. Yeah, that's a, we call that critical thinking, mm-hmm. cultivating critical mm-hmm. thinking in the academy. Um, but, but maybe, maybe it's possible that this is what should have been more at your, um, in your education as a, as a young man, that kind of. Yeah, you know, like, I've, yeah. I've, I've thought about that a lot. Because I just, I wasn't a great student. I was a terrible student. Was, that's what's lurking in the background of all of this. Um, like, I didn't get to Howard and become a great student. I was, and become a bad student. I was like a bad student in high school. I got kicked out of high school. I, I had to do this, well, I didn't have to, but I did this, uh, this thing that uh, Henry Louis Gates does, uh, Finding Your Roots. And part of finding my roots was my high school transcript, <laughs> um, which was shown to me. And somehow it was worse than I remembered. <laughs> um, I failed English in 11th grade. I got to Howard, I failed American Lit, failed Brill. It's just terrible, terrible. And the worst part about it, like, I love to read. I love to read. You know what I mean? I just felt like I was going to read what I wanted to read when I wanted it. And yeah. you weren't going to tell me. <laughs> You also listened to a lot of music back then. I did, I did, and I did, yeah. I'll, I'll confess, I read um, <laughs> Between the World and Me on an on a airplane, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Kamasi Washington's album had just come out, The mm. Epic, and so he was in, the music was in my ear, I'm reading mm. your words, mm. and I remember landing and tweeting, oh my God, that was amazing. Mm. And I wanted to recommend to everybody mm. that if you're going to read the book, listen to this music at the same time, Mainly because um, you, both of you interwove in my ear and imagination a long tradition, a radical sound mm. that I feel black, the best black art and captures mm-hmm. um, the struggle of African Americans. And I thought, you know, this would be a good question for you. If you could recommend mm. a soundtrack for your writings or Between the World and Me, uh, what, what would be on that playlist? I was even going to play music <laughs> that I know you referenced and just get your... Um, so, I mean, the easy answer is like uh, a bunch of hip-hop. Um, so Raekwon. Like, yeah, yeah, a lot of Raekwon, a lot of Wu-Tang, a lot of, a lot of Nas, um, a lot of Rakim, all of that. But... Um, I really do think Marvin Gaye. I really, I think like, um, like I, I really think um, like, like uh, I play Let's Get It On a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say what's going on. No, no, no. I play Let's you Get It On. You said Let's Get It yeah, On. Yeah, Let's Get It On. Which okay. I mean, what's get it, I mean, but see, everybody knows what's going on. It's a great, I mean, and it's a, but Let's Get It On is so like uh, raw. I'm talking about the whole album, not just the song. The song is great. <laughs> But that album is just so raw and dirty and carnal, and it's so from here. And if you know the story about how it was made, it's just really, yeah, it's tough. oof, yeah. uh, we, won't, we won't go there. <laughs> um, but, like, by the time you, like, get to, like, Distant Lover and, like, how, like, he goes, as I you know, was just saying earlier, from that, you know, falsetto to sort of moaning to, like, this deep, you know, sort of, you know, James Brown soul growl, and he does it effortlessly, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. and I listen to that, and I feel a sort of way, and I feel like when I write, I want you to feel that way. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like, I, like I, you know, literature is not like music. It doesn't, you know, have the same sort of, you know, visceral um, grab on people in the same way, but even if that's out of my grasp in terms of the genre, I'm reaching for it n- nonetheless. And I think readers can feel it. It's one of the moving moments that you talk about it being at Howard and something about the black body possessing a certain freedom. Mm-hmm. And if you could write as well as these yes. people express themselves. As well as they dance. Yes, I wanted to write dance. like they danced. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's one of the beautiful passages. There's a lot of moving passages. Mm. Um, in between the world and me, and one of them I'm thinking about particularly is is you and Samori mm. at the movie theater on the Upper West Side, and mm. um, my and you capture uh, terrifically this kind of fierce, passionate way in which black parents feel mm. like they have to protect their mm. children. My colleague 
uh, Professor Emily Bernard has written about this for The Atlantic, mm -hmm. uh, about being the, the mother of twin daughters, um, black daughters. Um, and I'm, I'm asking this out of curiosity. How would your father, or if you were Samori, how would your father and or your mother react it to that situation? Wow. So, I mean, again, for those who haven't read the book, basically we were coming from, uh, it was 2004, we were coming from Howl's Moving Castle. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I had just got hired at Time Magazine, and I was, it, this was a Sunday, and I was starting on Monday. And I almost got arrested on that Sunday. I, everything could have been totally different. I think about how many close calls. And basically we were coming out of Howl's Moving Castle, and we were on that escalator coming down. And it was a lot of people. And this woman pushed my kid. And I'm, I'm not, like, an aggressive person. I'm, you know, I'm not, like, a, you know, a fight. I'm not, I'm just not that guy at all. You know, I never was. She can't push my kid. I mean, that's just, like, if it's anywhere in me and you want to see it, you know, you just push my son and then we'll find out. <laughs> so I kind of got into it with this woman. And, it, you know, what really angered me was not her. What angered me was there was a white guy who jumped in the middle of it and started taking up for her. Mm. Like, yo, you got this four-year-old kid. Why are you not taking him for the four-year-old kid? You know what I mean? Like, he automatically assumed that I must have been, you know, doing, you know, something to... I, I don't know, man. My dad, you know, <laughs> you know lived on a, a truck when he was, like, six years old. You know, um, my mom is, you know, from the projects of West Baltimore. I have no idea what they would have done. It, yeah. it would have been worse than what I did, though. Right. I think it would have been much, right. you know, much, much worse. You know, um, at the same time, you know, I, like, like I think about that moment, and I was so out of my own head. I remember feeling like out of my own head. And the only thing that brought me back was seeing Samari. You know, you see this, like, four-year-old kid who's, like, looking at you, and it's like, oh, my dad's losing it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And that was, that was really the only thing that, 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 that brought me back. Um, I suspect they would have had a similar or, you know, more extreme reaction. Yeah. I have a, maybe a couple more questions. And one of the, U, UVM joined a number of schools across the country that assigned Between the World and Me as its common read. And we've had vigorous conversations mm -hmm. and debates and one of them was, as you can imagine, about the idea of those who believe they're white. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could, um, for me, that echoes James Baldwin, yes, obviously, a very important yes, it does. article that he wrote uh, in Essence. But I'm thinking about what, what are the implications for people to... It doesn't just echo it. I literally got it from there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like that was the first place yeah. I saw it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Baldwin does an amazing job of mm -hmm. linking up whiteness to power and the privileges of, of that. And you yeah. do that as well. And I'm wondering about, for folks who have a difficult time of, the, of thinking about whiteness in those terms, not ethnically, not culturally, but in right. terms of power, could right. you speak about, speak about that? Yeah, I mean, just give me a moment to unwind this a little bit. Yeah. Um, so the, the essay by Baldwin, which is remarkable, and all you guys should read it. It'll take you like 15 minutes. It's really short. Um, it's called On Being White and Other Lies. And it is a powerful essay because it basically argues that there is no real anything called whiteness in America save power. <clears throat> it doesn't mean there's no, you know, group of people who check Caucasian, you know, on their census. It doesn't mean that there's no group of people with, you know, blue eyes or, or blonde hair or lighter skin or anything like that. But the designation of white, in other words, the decision to exclusively call that group of people white is, in fact, a political decision. It does not, in fact, reflect, you know, the ancestry and the biology that I, you know, just um, pointed out. And we know this to be true, actually. How do we know it to be true? I am sitting here right now in Burlington, Vermont, and I obviously identify as black, okay? 
If I were living in New Orleans 200, 250 years ago, I might not. I might be identified as something totally different. If I were living in Brazil right now, I might be identified as something totally different. Only a month ago, and I'm ashamed to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it. I was deeply insulted, but I'm going to tell it. Only a month ago, <clears throat> I was with my wife in Martinique, and uh, there was a sister there from uh, Senegal. And she was telling my wife, uh, who's a little darker than me, just a little bit, um, that she looked like, you know, she could be, you know, a S S Senegalese. She could be from Senegal. <laughs> I said, well, I look like I could be from Senegal. She looked at me, rolled her eyes. She said, you look like you could be from Morocco. <laughs> Which, <laughs> for an African-American, you know what I mean? It's like, because we think of ourselves as black, 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 right? As this real, you know, sort of thing. And it became this joke. But the idea was we call ourselves black as a particular thing. But it's a political decision that we've made here that, that is as, you know, result from history. You study the Haitian Revolution. Mm. When the French uh, are, are, are fighting against Toussaint and, and his troops, they send over a group of Polish mercenaries. Well, the Polish mercenaries get over there, and they realize that, in fact, they have more in common with the black Haitians there than they do with the French who sent them over to fight. And they end up actually siding with the black Haitians, such to the extent that when the French Revolution succeeds, Dessalines declares these people black. <laughs> that community is still in Haiti today. It's a political decision. In America, the political decision was made to draw the line that way so that white men could have as much access as possible to the bodies of black women, but at the same time still produce the maximum amount of slaves possible. Mm. You see, in a mixture, you know, uh, 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 gives you a problem. Because what do you do about the child? What do you do about the offshoot? And if what you're trying to do is maximize the number of slaves, as monstrous as this sounds, you need the ability to enslave your child too. That's what you need. Now, we draw the line in, in, in a particular place. But the one drop. The one drop rule. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's a re reflection of. But we only draw that line because of power. It has nothing to do with ancestry or anything. People who we refer to as racially black and people who we refer to as racially white have been, you know, around each other since, at the, at the very least, since the days of the Roman Empire. Before this idea of what we call, you know, white and black today actually existed. So it's a political choice. And once I understood that, it just clarified so much. And it actually locked something into this book that I was trying to, you know, really get to because what we face in America largely, when you're talking about, you know, the problems of racism in this country, is the fact that in order to move forward, people who consider themselves white, people who believe in the importance of being white, people who think being white is actually significant in their lives will have to part with that. Now, what does that mean? Doesn't mean they have to part with their skin complexion. Doesn't mean they have to part with their hair. Doesn't mean they have to part with anything that we would identify, you know, in the human genome. It means they would have to part with the suite of privileges that comes with that. And if you got rid of that, why would white as a race even exist? Mm. Why would black as a race even exist? The difference between us as black people and white people is we would very eagerly part with the idea of being a black race. Now, we would still have culture. We would still have the way we talk. We would still have <laughs> <laughs> the way we shake hands. We still had the music. We still had the food we like. You know what I mean? Like, we have a cultural identity, just like within the broader, you know, white race. You have a Jewish identity. There's culture within that. Italian-American identity. There's culture within that that, that that would still remain. But the race piece of it is only power. It's only power. And so when I, when I wrote this book, it was so important to me to write it in that way, to not reify the lie that we have a problem between the races, because the races don't actually exist. We have a problem of racism in this country, and to put it that way. I'm thinking about um, maybe one more from me, and then the students have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about 
how other interlocutors have very much desired in the age of Black Lives Matter post-Ferguson to hear you, and you open up the book with this, to talk about hope. Mm. And, mm. and I'm, not sure, I'm, I'm not sure where I fall on that, on mm -hmm. that particular spectrum, but clearly you and I, and, and I think this is some of the reason why, you and I represent physically a level of success. Mm. Mm. That may, and a black presidency also suggests, mm. you know, even though he ran on that, President Obama, Senator Obama ran on this idea of, of hope. Um, but I'm wondering, why does the country need to hear, particularly out of the mouths of black people, why do they need to hear optimism? Why do they need to hear voice, hope? Is there space for some gray area? And I ask this because the majority of people that look like us do not celebrate the same kind of privileges mm -hmm. that you and I have. Mm -hmm. So right now, on this very day, voter suppression mm -hmm. is happening. Right now, someone is being mocked because of their color. Right now, mm -hmm. so much is happening due to mm -hmm. this. So why hope, particularly after Pittsburgh, after Charleston, after Charlottesville? Why hope? Why do we need that? Why does the country need that? Yeah, so I, I think it, there are two different answers here. Uh, so I think uh, for black Americans, one of the things you should know about me is I wasn't raised Christian. And, and I think this separates me largely from the vast majority of African Americans. Um, there, there is a, a strong ethos uh, in black Christianity of the meek inheriting the earth. Mm. You know, uh, when Obama speaks about the arc you know, of, of history, like bending towards like, like justice, like or Martin Luther King, you know, we as a people will get to the mountaintop. That is um, at the core of black folks. I mean, even, you know, as much as I, you know, and I, I love fire next time, but I think that, like, we end up in two different places. Hmm. You know what I mean? He ends up in this place of, you know, preaching the power of love, of loving our, you know, white brothers, and, you know, that love having the power to, you know, move us forward. And, and I'm not repeating that mockingly or sarcastically. I'm saying literally that, that that's where he ends up in the book. I really think having been raised outside of Christianity and really having been raised as an agnostic and ultimately becoming an atheist probably alters my perspective quite a bit. Um, most things don't end up well. Mm -hmm. um, that is generally the, you know, the, rule, the rule of history. Mm -hmm. um, what I find you know, when, when, I, when I look across history is chaos. It's real. Things might go well, or they, you know, they might not. Beyond that, speaking specifically to African Americans, what I find is at the moment in which there's black progress, tremendous black progress, there usually is a moment where a critical mass of white people have decided that that's in their interest. So it's not that um, <laughs> people forget this. You think about like the Civil War, right, and emancipation, and you know, we bask in the glow of emancipation, the great victory, and, and, and it, it really was. But Abraham Lincoln only won that election because, in fact, the Democratic Party was splintered into three different candidates. That's why he was able to win. And then once he won, and the Civil War you know, was effectively inaugurated, in the first you know, two years, you know, he largely does not want to make this a war about slavery. When it becomes clear that it is a war about slavery and that, you know, he comes around, that's what he's making war against, what is the country's answer to him? He's shot in the head. First president of the United States uh, to be assassinated was assassinated not just by a white supremacist, but by a white supremacist who wrote, white supremacy is why I'm doing this. People forget this about Booth. Booth wrote a whole lot. He explained it completely. Booth was not crazy. Booth was a confederate. And he made it, you know, you can, as I said, you know, don't take my word for it. You know, you get out of here, Google, you know, John Wilkes Booth. You can find his letter. He makes it very, very clear why he did it. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is absolutely, absolutely, you know, incredible. Fast forward 100 years, and it's like, you know, uh, you, you know, you think about Martin Luther King, who this country valorizes, king of love. Everybody loves 
Martin Luther King. But what was this country's answer to Martin Luther King when he was alive in his time? And <laughs> the answer was not from, you know, a bunch of crazies down in Mississippi. They had answers too. But not from a bunch of, you know, uh, wild-eyed people down in the South, but from the federal government was to bug him <laughs> and to harass him. The head of law enforcement in this country went on a years-long campaign to harass this guy that we, you know, now valorize as an American saint. We've named uh, the FBI building after this dude. <laughs> I mean, just think about this. And your president signed off on it. Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson signed off on it. Kennedy signed, you know, these people that we valorized, they signed off on it. And his treatment of this country, like Lincoln, ends with him being shot. You gotta, like, ask some difficult questions about that, man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, you really gotta, like, think hard about that. You gotta think hard about, you know, as, you know, and I'm happy as anybody um, that we had a black president, but you need to really think hard about what it meant that half of the opposition party literally did not accept him as a legitimate president. That is dangerous and scary. That its response to a black president who had to go to two Ivy League schools, had to be head of the law review, you know, had to be morally about as sound as you can get and still be a human being, <laughs> you know, um, had to be, you know, about as far as you can go and still be black. <laughs> And the answer to this dude was, was to elect Donald Trump. That was the response. You, you have to draw some conclusions about this. And you know, it's like, like I thought about this, like when, when I said, you know, listen, white people in America have enough self-regard and enough self-interest to not elect Donald Trump. They don't have to love black people in order to, you know what I mean, not elect. They got enough self-regard that they would be like, no, no, not this dude. He can't have the nuclear coat. He can't have a football. Not that dude to realize that a critical mass of people in this country who think they are white, who believe they are white, who that belief is of tremendous importance to, would sacrifice themselves and their own and children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And their future. And the future. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Strictly as a, as, as a reaction to this. And you know, I know there are other factors, but I mean, the, the data is really clear at this point. It's really, really clear as to what this was, man. Um, that is scary, and so I understand taking all that together and a large number of factors, which I have not mentioned, why somebody might approach a guy like me and say, man, give us some hope, brother. <laughs> <laughs> give us some hope. But I feel like, as a writer, and being true to that, and being you know, respectful to all of you who have, who have come here tonight, who I, I just I so much appreciate, it would be wrong for me to read a bedtime story to you. Mm. Like, it, it would be deeply disrespectful to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you can, um... I have to tell you what I, what I think, and then you can go and say, well, he's wrong, da, da, da. I mean, you can, you know what I mean? I'm just saying you gotta accept it. But I, 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 I can't give it to you just because it'll make you feel better. Yeah. That, that's not how I was raised. That's not, you know, what happened at Howard. That's not, you know, what happened with all the, you know, interlocutors that, that I've had all over the course of, of my career. Before we ask the students to ask a question, something that you kind of gently address mm -hmm. is gender and masculinity. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about several times have you, how you talked about yourself as a soft teenager. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I understand how the streets, that can be a very dangerous mm -hmm. space to occupy, even though it's naturally you. Mm -hmm. In writing this book, in writing this book to your son, did you think about those particular issues of what his, what his humanity mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a young man is and the range of that? Yeah, I did. It was um, tough, though, uh, because he, he I mean, it was tough for me to get to it for him, mm -hmm. because he is, like, the world that he inhabited was so different than mine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
I was, you know, sensitive. I am sensitive. Mm -hmm. You know, I was soft. I am soft. It ain't changed. <laughs> you, know, I, you know what I mean? Um, I didn't really become a writer before, you know, until I could step into that and say, you know, that, well, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that happens on a broader level with a book like Between the World and Me, again, you know, it's like I was saying with um, your kids, like, I, I was really, I had this friend who had been killed. And it had been 14 years since he'd been killed, and I had been thinking about him every day. And I had been for a long time really, really angry about it. And I felt strongly that I had gotten to the point as a writer where I could challenge myself and write something brief that explored the range of feelings that, 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 that I had around that. And I wasn't clear that I could do that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I thought it was like a theory. I thought I could, my editor thought I could, my agent thought I could, but it was, you know, it was a reach. It was a, it was a step. And when the book was published, you know, it became this big thing, and it, and I would never wish this. I think um, other people might tell you that it overshadowed a lot of other, you know, legitimate work. Um, and I think other people might tell you it overshadowed a lot of legitimate work from black women. And what happens is I think because we're at this point in our history where um, we're always in search of the, the, the one black person or the one black book, it becomes this thing of why does it, you know, this in fact is a very limited perspective on what it means to be black in America. Mm. It is a limited perspective on what, what it you know, means yeah. to be black in America. It, it was never meant to be what it became. I mean, who, who can tell? You can, you can never tell that you know, it's actually going to get elevated to that level and you know, um, have to assume that you know, on its shoulders. You know, I, I've thought a lot about that since. And one of the things I've really landed on is I couldn't really write it differently. And I wouldn't want to write it differently. And I, I wouldn't myself want to write differently. What I want is as much as possible um, to aid the proliferation of voices that are much yeah. more different than, I, than me. Yeah. And that, you know, yeah. goes... Um, yeah. Because it's a, it's a structural problem. Do you, you know what I mean? It's a oh. structural problem. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that, you know, I, I've really, you know, taken it on, you know, in my mind to, you know, use what, whatever gravitas I, I, I have to make sure that, you know, um, black women, you know, writers, you know, who are doing this, you know, as they've always done it, mm -hmm. um, get heard, you know, in, in, in the way that they deserve. Preach, preach. <laughs> I think we have some questions from students. Like many of us in this room, today is likely the day your son is voting for the first time if not in future elections. I realize this is a vast question and does not probably have a simple answer, but I wonder how you felt voting for the first time and how the issues you cared about the most with in comparison to now. Hmm. And how do you talk with your son about what it means to vote? Hmm. That's a great question, because I didn't vote for the first time until I was 33 years old. Um, it was 2008 for Barack Obama. And, um, <laughs> We actually shouldn't clap for that, though, because I should have <laughs> <laughs> should have been voting before that. Um, I, I've actually I've thought a lot about this. You know what I mean? Like why why it took me so long and why um, why then? And I think like I mean at that moment it just felt like historical. Like you had to. There was no not voting. But I think I. Um, before that came from a place, and maybe some of the young people in this room are in this place right now. <clears throat> I came from a place where the whole thing is corrupt. The whole thing is bad. And if I, you know, vote, I am somehow enrolled in the badness. I'm somehow, you know, um, a, a part of it. And I had a very um, radical but limited <laughs> view of politics. You know, I was probably, you know, not probably, I was someone, you know, who would have, you know, told, you know, well, you know, ultimately, you know, in, in a two-party system like we have, you know, you're going to end up endorsing 
a lesser evil at best. And, you know, what a professor recently, you know, she, you know, put it was, Professor Barbara Ransby out in Chicago, she said, yes, that's true, but I'm in favor of less evil. <laughs> and, you know, if I didn't, I had gotten to that point, but I had never, you know, quite, you know, you know, figured it out like that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, because I think, like, you know, where I was, you know, before them was that I wanted voting to be this, because it's kind of pitched to you this way, too, you know, given the tradition and, you know, what, what voting means in the African community. You know, it's supposed to be like this pure ritual where it expresses, you know, who represents me and who I believe in and, you know, how I feel about the world. And this person represents, you know, the kind of world that I want to live in when, in fact, it often just represents the forestalling of evil, mm. the prevention of evil. Voting is um, taking out the trash, man. It's taking, and you have to take out the trash. You can't not take out the trash. <laughs> you know? Um, and just like taking out the trash is not the end of, you know, your, you know, process of hygiene and, and cleaning up and keeping a clean house, Voting is not the end of your political engagement. Mm. Um, it's an important part of it. It's a really, really, like, you got to take out the trash. You got to vote. You got to. You know That's what I mean? But, but after you vote, you have to do all those other things that allow us to one day, hopefully, live in a world where we aren't just confronted with going to the ballot and forestalling evil. Mm. Thank you. Next question. Hi, um, my name is Joe Warren. I'm from Williston, Vermont. Uh, this past May, you wrote an article in The Atlantic about Michael Jackson and Kanye West mm. and their complicated relationship to celebrity as African-American males. Mm. You included yourself in those reflections as well. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and especially about what you think the role of celebrities in general might be in a democracy? Wow. I need to talk to my therapist about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm dead, y'all, I'm dead serious. You know, it was funny, because like, when I wrote that piece, I, you know, I was obviously as, uh, I was like really upset at Kanye, and I was really mad. But, um, again, you know, I, I go back to this, like when this, when Between the World and Me came out, it, um, oh my God, I could tell y'all stories. <laughs> it completely altered, like, everything. Like, it just, like, I was, you know, and I have been, you know, a, a relatively, you know, struggling writer. I would walk down the street and, no one, you know, really, you know, it was just normal. Everything was like normal. And everything was not normal, you know what I mean? Um, and in some ways that was like really, really good. You know, people would come up to me and they would break down and cry and, you know, and that was the good part, but I didn't even know how to receive the good part. Because in my mind, I was just doing what I had, you know, normally done. I was just, you know, sort of, you know, being me. And then there was like the bad part. And the bad part was, um, A, the sheer amount of things that people offer you that should not be offered to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I had, <laughs> Jesus, I had people that would like write me and would say, hey, um, there's this secret meeting over here <laughs> um, that you can attend and we'll fly you and your family out on a, a private plane. Um, and you can, you know, bring your family and, you know, you guys can sit around with all these other millionaires and billionaires and just sort of talk. That sounds harmless. It's not, though. It's not. It's actually, you know, quite, quite harmful. I had people that would write me and say, do you want to direct this music video by Kendrick Lamar and Mary J. Blige? True story. True story. And I would think, like, what, what in my world have I done <laughs> to make anyone think? that I'm capable of directing anybody's music video. <laughs> Constantly things would be off, but now I was 39 going on 40 when Between the World and Me came out. I've been with my wife for 15 years, my son was 15. I was very set in who I was, I knew who I was, I, I knew you know, what, what was important. But it was still very destabilizing. You know, it is like to this very day, still, you know, tremendously destabilizing, and I thought, what if I was somebody else? What if I actually did not like my dad? And my dad used to call me big nose, you know, and make fun of my African features. You know, what if, you know, uh, my mom 
was my rock in the world, and my mom had died getting plastic surgery? And what if I felt completely cut off from my family, and I felt like I didn't have roots and, and, and a basis? And what if I was on top of that, even though this wasn't confirmed at the time? You know, I suspected I didn't want to make a, you know, a diagnosis in that piece. And what if I was struggling with mental health issues? Who might mm. I be? Mm. What might happen? We're talking Kanye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what might I say? What if I had no one around me who, A, either loved me enough, or just, you know, loved me and didn't have the ability to stop me and to say no. People who love you, their highest calling is to tell you no. And what if I didn't have a community around me to tell me no? I mean, you might see me tap dancing in the Trump White House up there. You know what I mean? It's possible. It's possible. You know, and so um, I felt tremendous anger at Kanye at first. And then, and, and, and I feel this even now, I just felt sad. Because, like, I know how this story ends. I, you know, like, I can remember, you know, and this is only slightly related, like, when, you know, like, Biggie and Tupac were going back and forth. And I can remember, this don't end well. Mm -hmm. Like, these dudes are, like, I saw the video for Hit Em Up. I know that's before most of y'all time. But I was, you know, you go back and watch Hit Em Up, and you'll see, you'll, you will think this probably, oh, I see how somebody got shot. <laughs> you'll watch videos and see it. And as shocked as I was that both of them ended up dead, like when you look at the events, you're not so much. Mm. I was a journalist, a music journalist in 2003, had just moved to New York, and ODB had gotten out of prison. And he was out of his mind on drugs. And they had him at this press conference. And people were asking him questions and lobbing these questions, and he clearly had no one around him who loved him because he was completely incoherent. And I thought, this don't end well. And he was dead like eight months later. Wow. So I fear for Kanye. Like, actually, like, I fear, you know, for Kanye. Like, I imagine people who knew Marvin Gaye, like, feared for Marvin Gaye. It's a lot, man. It, it really, and I'm not trying to condone. Obviously, in that essay, I didn't condone anything he said. You know, obviously, I don't think slavery is a choice. I don't think that's OK. You know, I don't think, you know, him, you know, doing that macho thing he did in the White House is OK. But what I think is significantly worse is that there aren't people in his life who love him enough to put him in a headlock, handcuff him, <laughs> and say, nah, bro. Because you need that. Yeah, thank you. Maybe two more, one more. Two more. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your book might have been different if you'd written it to a daughter. Yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, and the honest answer is, I don't know. Um, because like, you got like, to think about like, how the book is structured and how it's built. Again, like, my friend who got killed was a black male. And he was killed like, shortly after I had had this black son who was just born. And uh, it is built on all of my time as a young black male, and it is built on all of my time raising a young black male, and that particular experience. It, it, it's tough to um, unbake the cake. Mm -hmm. do, do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, wow, this chocolate cake is really cool, you know? Um, what if it was strawberry shortcake? Um, well, I like strawberry shortcake. <laughs> Um, but I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know like, how I would have done it. I don't know what would have been different. It's a completely different, you know what I mean, formula. Um, it might have been titled something different. I might have angled it differently. I don't know. Or maybe I would have just done it like I did it. Mm. You know, it could be that it wouldn't have changed at all. You know, but my experiences with Samari are my experiences with Samari. You know, um, and so it's tough. It's tough. I mean, but it really just takes me back to that point of saying, um, we really, really need more books. <laughs> we really, really need more books. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think it's like really important that people not read this book and feel like, well, okay, I got it. That's black America. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I hope that the book is an entryway you know, into, you know, the, the vast and, and large, larger black canon. Yeah. 
That's our last question. Hmm. In what ways would you change your Baltimore education to diminish your view of the classroom as a jail of other people's interests? Mm. Wow. That's deep. <laughs> what I've done. I don't know, man. Um, I think, like, uh, much of what gave me that idea then is still present in the kind of public schools that black and brown people go to, black and brown kids go to today. The most revealing um, thing for me was when we enrolled Samari in school and it was very important to us, or important to me, that I not repeat what happened to me, that, I, that the school experience be different. And <clears throat> with some amount of energy and resources, you know, we were able to duplicate that. And like, I, I can remember um, like visiting schools. Samari, you know, from middle school, he went to this like uh, private school in, in, in um, New York called the Manhattan Country School. And I can remember going to tour and I was like, this does not look like anything I recognize as school. Um, where are the people, you know, clutching their number two pencils? Where is the single file line? You know, um, I was invited to a lecture a few you know, years back to this you know, really nice school in DC, Georgetown Day School. And when um, I went to give the lecture, it was you know, like an auditorium and there were levels. And the kids just kind of like floated in and talked and you know what I mean? They weren't organized or in any sort of, and nobody was yelling at them to get organized. And they just kind of threw their book bags down and they just sat there and just sort of did like this. And I thought about how regimented like black kids have to be. And how black and brown kids are, you know, listen, you gotta get in single file, go like this, you know, look like this, you know, do this, do that, no talking, you know, get your laboratory pass if you gotta go to the bathroom. Like, there's a heavy discipline ethic to it. And I do not mean discipline in terms of being a disciplined learner. Which they had at the school I sent Samari to, which they had at, you know, Georgetown Day School. They certainly had discipline within the idea of study, but and a lot of these schools, you know, it's, it's discipline on, on, on an entirely different level. It's a kind of regimentation, a kind of shrinking, you know, of, of who you are into this, like, box, man. You know what I mean? And you kind of put yourself in this box. Your classroom is a box. You sit at this desk, that's a box. You know, like, I would go into Samari's class, they'd be sitting in a circle. I'd never seen that. You understand? I mean, I saw it, like, when I got to college, I saw it. Let me, you know, be really clear about that. But I had never seen that in a, like, school, like, in a middle school, you know? Um, he, uh, his first year there, he was cutting school. I'm sorry to embarrass you, Samara. He was cutting school in, in the park, and they brought him back to the school, and the school called me up and said, you know, your son got, you know, brought to, the, to, you know, to school today by the truancy office, and I almost blew my top. I was going crazy. I said, oh, my God, he's going to go to jail. He's going to be a drug dealer. <laughs> you know, all the, like, nightmares. <laughs> And I got to that school, and that woman looked at me, she said, calm down, it's okay. She said, this is the first time the police have ever come to the doors of our school. But it's okay. <laughs> Everything's going to be okay. I said, oh, it's gonna go on his record, he's not gonna get into a good high school, it's all gonna go downhill. No, no, it's all right. It's all right. And you know what? It was all right. It really was, like the whole sort of panicked attitude that I likely inherited from my parents, and I likely inherited from the kind of teachers I had and the kind of educational system I was in was very, very different. And there are re the reasons why those schools are that way, mm. because those schools exist in an entire ecology where you know, that sort of control and regimentation is actually very important. It might save your life. You know, so it's not like the schools exist in the abstract of, you know, some, you know, broader society. And I think, like, one of the reasons why, you know, Samari was afforded the sort of privileges that he had with his education is because he was in a completely different ecology. It was totally, totally different. You know, so I probably would not have changed the school. I would have changed the whole dynamic, probably, yeah. you know, if I, if I could have. Thank you for those questions. I think, I think most people here could probably stay the rest of the evening, but we can't.
And so I want to thank you, Major, I want to thank you, Ta-Nehisi, I want to thank you so much for coming to Burlington, Vermont.